Well, as you know, since 9-11, we've had a war on terror. Uh, and uh, what makes terrorists so challenging is they slip in unnoticed until they attack. And they cause all kind of devastation and problems. And really, Hasatan or Satan, in a sense, has an Al-Qaeda terrorist group of his own. False teachers who slip in unnoticed in the visible body of Messiah. They may appear as angels of light, but knowingly or unknowingly, they propagate false teaching. They cause uh, all kinds of spiritual destruction in the body of Messiah as a whole. So just like we seek to be vigilant against the physical terrorists, you know, that in our world today, sadly, that we have to deal with, just as we have to deal with that, we have to, uh, we're, Jude, uh, we're looking in the book of Jude right now, he reminds us to be vigilant to guard against spiritual terrorism by these false teachers. And we looked at this uh, some weeks back. He said to contend earnestly for the faith. And we need to do that. We need to contend earnestly for faith in face of these false teachers. So we're going to be continuing our series in the book of Jude. And I mentioned his, his Hebrew name would be Judah or Yehuda. And so if, if, if you want to follow along, we've got the, the outline inside the bulletin. Uh, or for those on the live stream, you can download uh, the outline and you can uh, use that to, to, to guide you uh, through the message. You see the title of the message is False Teachers, Their Identity and Destiny. Their Identity and Destiny. I don't know if we'll get all the way through the destiny part, but we may start into that today. So in the last message in, in our series of the book of Jude... We began looking at the identity of these false teachers, and we gained insight into their identity by some characteristics of these false teachers that, that Jude describes to us uh, in, in verse, verse 4 and, and uh, going into, into verse 5. Look, look at uh, Jude verse 4 again, just to remind you. Um, because I'll start just recapping some of that, and then we're going to go on to verses 5 through 7. But he said, For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turned the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Yeshua the Messiah. Okay, I, I preached on this, most of this last time, so I'm just going to just like highlight it and then we'll move on. But for one thing, false teachers normally creep in unnoticed. That's why I talked about like terrorists at the beginning. In other words, they creep in unnoticed there. In this case, they, they creep in unnoticed into congregations, into schools, into the body of Messiah at large. Okay, and then the next thing he pointed out was these false teachers are marked out for condemnation. They claim to be followers of Yeshua, but they're actually misleading people. They're apostates. They're not true followers of Yeshua. And false teachers are ungodly. Uh, we looked at uh, Jude 14 and, and 15, those verses last time. In other words, if you examine their lives closely, you see their lives don't match up with what the Scriptures say their lives should match up with. Uh, in other words, you'll find some ungodliness there somewhere in, 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 the, in the way they live. Now, Jude, in, the, in his just one-chapter book, he doesn't go through detail describing all the different types of false teachings and, and things like that. Instead, what he, because if he did give some examples, they might have been outdated today. And also, he may leave out some that, that, that you wouldn't necessarily know about. So, what he does instead is he talks about their lives and how their lives don't match up with the Word of God. And the reason for that is because they are, they're not believers and they're into false teaching. And then false teachers propagate false doctrine. 
In other words, in some ways, they're teaching things that are contrary to the Word of God. And I want to point out some various false things that they might teach. I'm not going to, can't mention every possible one, but I'll just mention some different categories and, and just to try to help us understand how could we identify these false teachers. All right, here's one thing. And that is they often turn the grace of God into licentiousness. Now, that licentiousness is a big word. It's just not like sexual sin. All right, so these teachers, to various degrees, misinterpret and teach God's grace as license to do whatever their flesh desires with no in, in, inhibitions. In other words, to various degrees, they have no moral absolutes. And so they end up compromising and they end up sinning, especially in sexual sin. So that's one characteristic of them. In some ways, they deny our master and Lord Yeshua. In other words, they're off in some way about who Yeshua really is. In other words, that he's the Son of God, the Messiah, the Lord. Or what he's really like is described in the scriptures and, and what he did for us. He willingly allow, allowed himself to die on the cross as an atonement for our sins. Now, most false teachers today do not come out and openly deny Yeshua the Messiah because that, that would be, you know, that would be very unpopular if they did something like that. So what they do is instead they talk about Yeshua. People think, oh, well, they're not against Yeshua. And then they turn Yeshua into a mamby-pamby teacher who teaches to love everybody, but he doesn't care about sin, they deny Yeshua was really the Son of God. They deny Yeshua's bodily resurrection. So that's, that's where we left off last time in the series. Okay, so I'm going to pick up now, and I want to talk a little bit more about this. Then we'll go into verses 5 through 7. Another false doctrine uh, that false teachers propagate is they deny the authority of Scriptures. They deny the authority of scriptures. And this is a real important one to understand. False teachers don't take the Bible seriously. They don't take it literally or at face value. They believe it has errors in it. Or it has stories in it that didn't really happen. Or that the stories are fables or myths just to communicate some spiritual meaning. They set themselves up in judgment of the Bible and pick and choose what they want to believe in it or not versus letting what the scriptures teach uh, stand in judgment of them. So they're standing over the Bible, whereas the Bible is supposed to be judging, you know, their actions. For example, they don't usually believe in miracles recorded in the scriptures and they explain them away. Many years ago, uh, there, there was a president and a, and a professor at Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and he did not believe that the, the Red Sea parting happened like the Bible said. He, did, he didn't believe that Elisha the prophet caused an axe head to float in the water. And he tried to explain those miracles away with purely naturalistic explanations. Now, thankfully, he was forced out, so that false teaching is not true there at that seminary anymore. But I'm just saying that's an example, and sadly, that's happened in many seminaries, in many Bible colleges and stuff. Not all of them by any means, but I'm just saying where there's false teaching like that, where there's this aversion to miracles, and they, so they try to explain the miracles of the Bible away. A well-known conservative Jewish rabbi here in Los Angeles uh, around a decade ago on Passover Eve said this, and I'm quoting. He said, the exodus certainly didn't happen the way the Bible depicted, assuming that it was a historical event, end quote. Okay, so this rabbi was doubting that the exodus really happened. Or if it did, he doubts that it happened the way the scriptures describe, namely with mir the miracles of the, of the ten plagues and the parting of the Red Sea. And also, 
uh, I was watching an interview of him, and you can, you can see it on the internet. He doesn't believe that Genesis 1 gives an adequate explanation for how the universe came into being. And the reason that he doubts all these things and probably doesn't really believe in them is because he doesn't see science or current archaeology support that. And so he chooses the supposed science and the supposed archaeology over the Bible and what the Bible says. And I've said this before that science and archaeology is just trying to catch up with the Bible. I mean, true archaeology and true science will support what the Bible has to say. But, it, you know, again, they haven't caught up yet. So, and, and, and again, I'm, I'm thankful that when this rabbi came out with this very, you know, bold statement, um, he, he got criticism from other Jewish rabbis, other conservative and orthodox rabbis who disagreed with him because of that viewpoint, and, and rightfully so. But let me just say that that rabbi who spoke against these miracles, sadly, he's not unique. Certainly not in the Reformed Jewish movement, which is my background, and, and also even in the conservative movement. I previously mentioned that 39% of the supposed evangelical pastors surveyed earlier this year said they believe there's no moral absolute truth and that each individual must determine their own truth. Amen. Now that's in contrast to what God says in the scriptures that what, he, where he, God, what God says is moral truth for everybody. Amen. But since these false teachers deny the authority of scriptures, they let their own personal view take precedence over what the scripture says. And again, this is not politically correct what I'm going to say, but it's biblically correct. Statements in the Bible that condemn behavior the false teachers think is okay, they will reinterpret and explain away. Such as sexual relations outside of marriage. The sanctity of human life, such as alternative sexual lifestyles. Sometimes false teachers change the meanings of biblical and theological words and disguise their true beliefs because they know if their true beliefs came out, rank and file people in congregations would say, wait a minute, that's not right. So they will use vocabulary that people are familiar with but they don't use our dictionary. They redefine words. So it's hard to pin down what, what they mean. I'll give you an example. Years ago, I read where one of these false teachers said they believe that Yeshua died for, for that person's sins. All right, well, that sounds right, okay? But then in another place, they turned around and said they didn't believe Yeshua's death paid the penalty for their sins. Which is what it means when we say Yeshua died for our sins. So this false teacher was assigning different meanings to the words. He meant something different than what people thought he meant. So let me kind of make it a little easier for you here. If you ever hear someone teach that the Bible has errors in it. Or that things didn't really happen the way the scriptures described that should be a big red flag that should go up in your mind and say that is false teaching and that's going to lead to more false teaching. Can I hear an amen? amen? All right, so that's a real key thing is that they don't take the Bible. And, and thankfully, the congregations I've ever been involved in, they didn't say stuff like that. But I remember years ago visiting a congregation and where the pastor was saying, well, it doesn't really mean that, and he was explaining stuff away from the Bible. That is false teaching. Another variation of this is that false teachers will have some other authority other than the Word of God. And that's especially true of what are called Christian cults. So I'm just making sure you know these things so you don't get surprised or caught off guard somewhere along the way. Here's an example of a Christian cult, the Mormons. 
How many of you have ever heard of Mormons? Okay, they usually are uh, riding around uh, in, well, they have a white shirt, they're on bicycles, and they have a, a name tag that says elder. And the guy is much younger than you, okay? He's like a teenager, okay, or something like that. All right, but anyway, the Mormons, or the full name is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Okay, so they have what's called the Book of Mormon, and they let that take precedence over the Bible. The Book of Mormon, they believe they need that to interpret the Bible properly. Another example of a Christian cult is Jehovah Witnesses. They change the translation to fit what they want to believe. They reinterpret certain verses of the Bible to match their errant beliefs. They don't, they don't believe that Yeshua is God. They believe he's less than God. Uh, here's another Christian cult. Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science. Uh, she, many years ago, she wrote a book called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, which she taught helped interpret the Scriptures. See, again, there's another authority that they use to try to, what they believe is to properly interpret the Bible. Some false teachers give experiences or visions uh, authority over the Scriptures. For example, Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormons, believes that he was given some golden tablets by an angel, the angel Moroni. If you've ever seen one of the uh, Mormon uh, 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 temples, like they have one down in downtown Los Angeles, there's somebody up on the steeple there. That's the angel Moroni. See, they're, they're exalting this angel, a false angel. Okay, again... Let me say this, I, what I'm going to share next, I'm sharing in love. I'm just sharing the truth, okay? Respectfully, the Catholic Church falls into this error too of denying the ultimate authority of Scripture. Now, let me say, what I'm going to say is not true of all Catholics, okay? But I'm talking about the organization of the Catholic Church and what they stand for they're in error in some areas, not all areas, but in some areas they're in error. The Catholic, and, and the reason is because they're not letting the scripture be the ultimate authority. So that's the reason I'm sharing this. For example, the Catholic Church has the deuterocanonical books called the Apocrypha. That's other writings they have in their Bible that are not in our Messianic Bible or, or our Protestant Bible. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so there's some other books like that. Um, like the Maccabees is an example. Bell and the Dragon. I don't remember all of them, but I'm just, those are just some examples of them. And, and some of these other books that are in their Bible, not in our Bible, support some of their errant beliefs. As an example, purgatory. If you've ever heard that term, where they think once somebody dies, if they're not a believer in, in Yeshua yet, that they can somehow be purified through fire somehow. Uh, well, that's purgatory. That's not, in, that's not biblical. Uh, or praying for the dead. We're not to be praying for the dead. Um, they, don't, they don't need prayer or, or, or your prayers are not going to make any difference. Also, as you know, the head of the Catholic Church is the Pope. Now, this hasn't happened but maybe once or twice in history, but actually the Pope can speak what they call ex cathedra. That means when he speaks like that, it's infallible. So they're putting that on, on par with the Scriptures. That's authoritative. Now, again, it, I think it's only happened once or twice, but the Pope incorrectly spoke Ex cathedrally, ex cathedra, said the Virgin Mary was conceived without original sin. That's called immaculate conception. And said that she was bodily assumed into heaven when her earthly curse, uh, course ended. In other words, that she didn't die, she just ascended into heaven like Yeshua did. All right, that's again, this is incorrect teaching. There's, church, there's been church councils in the Catholic Church over the years. And the, at the church council, if it comes out with a, with a particular view, that's considered on par with Scripture. For example, church councils in the past came up with the errant doctrine that Mary had no personal sin. They said she was sinless. 
and that she was a perpetual virgin. And I know she wasn't. I know, but I'm just saying. So I look. I've said in the past that the Virgin Mary was a very godly woman. Okay, she was the most blessed of women. But the scriptures don't cheat. Don't teach she was sinless. They don't teach that she was a perpetual virgin. She had other children after after Yeshua was born. Uh, she was not bodily assumed into heaven. The scriptures don't teach where to exalt her. She's not a, 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 a co-providing uh, yeah, salvation along with Yeshua somehow. Uh, or that we're to pray to her. Okay, so again, I, I share all that in love. I'm just saying that's the organized Catholic church. And, and, it, and again, their error is because they're not letting the scriptures dictate all their views. They do have many godly views. I'm just saying they get off on some things. Okay, here's another thing that is true of false teachers. They deny some essential doctrine of Scripture. They deny some essential doctrine of Scripture. For example, they'll portray God as only love, but not concerned about holiness. Even though the Scriptures makes it clear, God is concerned with holiness too. It's common that false teachers will deny that a personal relationship with Yeshua, the Messiah, is necessary to go to heaven. They'll typically, false teachers will typically say, oh, there's many ways to go to heaven. There's many ways to go to God. We're all going the same place. We're just trying to get there different ways. That's false teaching. Can I hear an amen? Amen. I mentioned in the previous message that the, this survey that was done of pastors earlier this year found that 30% of supposed evangelical pastors surveyed didn't believe that you had to trust Yeshua to forgive you of your sins to go to heaven. 30% of them thought there's other ways to get to heaven. And these are, these are people that claim to be men of God. And I guess even women of God. In other words, saying these things. In, in, uh, in the opening message of this series, I shared about the bad experience that I had growing up in, in Mississippi where there was a pastor on the same street that I lived on. He was a pastor of a mainline denomination church. And he didn't believe that my mother had to believe in Yeshua to go to heaven. He thought just being a nice person would get her into heaven. I'm just telling you, th these things are out there. They're here in Los Angeles. You may pass churches, and, and unfortunately, they may be teaching that kind of false doctrine. Uh, I read about a, a Southern Baptist seminary professor many years ago. Thankfully, he's not now. But many years ago, he used to teach evangelism at one of the Southern Baptist seminaries. And he didn't believe that a Jew had to have a personal relationship with Yeshua to go to heaven. He thought if they just try to be a good Jew, they'll get to heaven. Sounds like someone needed to teach him about Jewish evangelism because he was off on his beliefs. As I mentioned last time in our series, a third or more of the senior pastors surveyed believed the Holy Spirit was not a person, but just a symbol of God's power. That's denying what the scriptures teach about the Holy Spirit. So the apostate false teachers are in denial somewhere about some essential doctrine of the scripture. They, de they deny something about God. They deny something about Yeshua, who he is, what he did. They deny the gospel of Yeshua. They deny the authority of the word of God. They deny holy living. Okay, so that's just some general things to help you identify false teaching. Okay, now let's move on to number two. We'll start on this one. Jude then discusses the terrible destiny or fate of these false teachers. False teachers will be judged one day for their sins. Amen. Just like everybody else is going to be judged for the sins if they're not a believer in Yeshua. Okay, but false teachers will be judged one day for their sins and for their false teaching. And, uh, you know, that ultimate judgment, that's the lake of fire. 
I mean, that's an unpleasant thing to think about, but that's what God says in the Scriptures, that that's, that's where the ultimate destination is. All right, in, I mentioned that in the book of Jude, there's triads. There's like threes of different things that are mentioned. And now we're going to look at the fourth one in the book, and that's going to be dealing with judgment. So he's going to mention three examples of judgment. So remember three biblical examples of God's judgment in the past. The first one is going to involve our Jewish people. The second one is going to involve angels. And the third is going to involve Gentiles. I don't know if we'll get through all three of them today, but, but at least we'll start looking at those. All right, so here's the first example of judgment dealing with our Jewish people. We are reminded of judgment on the unbelieving Jews who came out of Egypt. We're reminded of the judgment on unbelieving Jews who came out of Egypt. All right, this is in verse 5. Okay, so let's look at that. Okay, so uh, Yehuda, Judah... He says, now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. Okay, so Jude here is writing in such a way that he assumes his readers are familiar with these stories in the Hebrew Scriptures. And he wants to remind them of it. And so that is a support for understanding the original readers were Messianic Jews, like us. Now, you might remember that when God brought our Jewish forefathers out of Egypt, due to their rebelliousness and their sin, God made them wander in the wilderness for how many years? Forty years. That's a long time. In fact, of the original one to two million people, if you include all the children and everything, who came out of Egypt, only two of them entered into the promised land. Who were those two? Joshua, Joshua, and Joshua and Caleb. Okay. So all the rest, except maybe a, except a few, and, and in that few, I'm thinking of Moses, I'm thinking of Aaron, Miriam, probably her, their brother, all the rest of them died in the wilderness in unbelief. In other words, God judged them there. In other words, they, think about it. They were all exposed to the ten plagues, these ten miraculous plagues in Egypt. They were all exposed to this tremendous miracle of the parting of the Red Sea. They, they had seen God miraculously provide manna and quail and water in the wilderness. Nevertheless, they didn't really believe God and turned back from following him ten times. It said they tested God ten times. And then out of fear, they refused to enter into the promised land when God offered it to them at Kadesh Barnea. So they acted like apostates in turning back from the truth. And God judged them and didn't allow them to enter the promised land. All right, so that's the first example of judgment that, that we see uh, in there. So that was a judgment of, of unbelieving Jewish people. Okay, here's the second one. And that is we're reminded of judgment on fallen angels. We're reminded of judgment on fallen angels. Look at Jude verse 6. It says, And angels... Who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. Who, who are these angels and that sort of thing? There's actually a parallel verse to this in 2 Peter 2, verse 4. So let me just show that to you. It's talking about the same angels. So it says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. So let me just say, there's been speculation over the years, you know, about who are these angels? What did they do? What, who, who's it referring to in these passages? Well, we get some clues just in the two verses that I read to you. All right, for one thing, it said they did not keep their own heavenly domain. 
So that's one clue. So that means whatever the sin was, it wasn't in heaven. They came down to earth and committed the sin. Verse 7, which I haven't read yet, says that they indulged in gross immorality. The angels in gross immorality. So there was some type of gross sexual sin involving these angels. And also verse 7 says they went after strange flesh. So that means they went after some, somebody that wasn't an angel. Namely women on earth. So I, this, this passage, I believe, is referring to the sin of these angels. All right, now here's the passage that I think is be, that these verses in the Brit Hadashara are referring to in the Hebrew Scriptures. So let's look at Bereshit chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. It says, now it came about, this is actually around the time of Noah, it's before the time of the universal flood, it says, now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them. Notice this expression, that the sons of God, and I'm going to explain about that in a moment, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Okay, now again, over the years, I mean, you can look in the commentaries, there's a lot of debate, like who in the world are these sons of God and who is this talking about in this passage here? Now, in Judaism today, and I'm talking about, you know, Jews that don't believe in Yeshua primarily, they believe that this B'nai Elohim, the sons of God, are just evil human judges or noblemen. That's what they would believe that in their commentaries and stuff like that. I don't think that's a good explanation for it. But I'm just, I'm just acknowledging that that's what, you know, some, a lot of rabbis and, you know, Jewish teachers, that's what they would say about that passage. Now, instead, I agree with those who say, B'nai Elohim, sons of God, that equals angels. And you say, how do you know that? Look in the book of Job. I give you the three references up there, especially ch chapter 1, verse 6, and Job chapter 2, verse 1. It's clear that's who the sons of God is referring to, angels. Now, of course, traditional Jews, they don't, they don't believe in Jude, the book of Jude. They don't believe in Second Peter that clearly points out that these were angels. But when they just, again, but that's what they were. They were angels. So I, I agree with those who believe that what Jude and what Peter is talking about and what in Bereshit, what they're talking about is that these are evil angels or demons. That's what an evil angel is, is a demon. It's the same thing. In some way, directly or indirectly, cohabitated with women back before the universal flood of, of Noah and they corrupted the human race further. Now this was apparently done by Hasatan because he wanted to corrupt human, uh, human life because he wanted to try to corrupt the seed that was promised in Bereshit chapter 3 verse 15. In other words, that's a, prof a messianic prophecy about how the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And that's a prophecy about Yeshua. So he's wanting to, he wanted to try to corrupt human race to try to stop that from happening. But obviously, you know, God's greater than him, so it wasn't going to happen. Now, to explain a little bit further. So either, now it's one or two views on this. Either these evil angels... Demon-possessed men 
who these men had sexual relations with the women and it ended up causing their, their, their children to be demon-possessed. That's one view of what this is talking about. The other view is that this was a unique situation where these angels, you know, they took a human form, which we see a lot in the Bible of angels taking human form. But somehow in that human form, this was very unique. They were actually able to have sexual relations with women as an angel. And again, their offspring were corrupted or demonized by these demons. So it's one of those two explanations for it, but it definitely was the evil angels. Actually, in Judaism, there's a minority viewpoint that shows up in the Midrash where they say this was talking about little angels descended from heaven, took mortal wives, and begot a race of giants. Okay, so that is even in Judaism, but I'm not saying that's the majority viewpoint. It's a minority viewpoint. So I believe these angels who sinned, they were apostate angels. Now, going back to the book of Jude, Jude says that these fallen angels, they're being kept right now in eternal bonds until the judgment of the great day. That's talking about the great white throne judgment that we read about in Revelation chapter 20. In 2 Peter 2 verse 4, uh, talking about the same evil angels, it says they've been cast into Hades. So this is a place where they are bound. They're committed to pits of darkness. So these, these uh, angels committed such a ho horrendous sin back at, in the time of Genesis 6 that they've been bound so they can't tempt anybody else to sin. They're bound until final judgment. Whereas the rest of the demons, you know, they're free. They're just roaming around and they're still tempting people and, and still sinning. And then eventually these, these demons are going to be judged in that final judgment. And they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. Along with Hasatan. He's going to eventually go in there. So the, it, in fact the Bible says the lake of fire was originally made for the devil and his evil angels. The apocryphal book of Enoch, which is not inspired scripture. I want to make sure that's clear. It does have a correct picture here because it describes these angels coming down to earth. Now it mentions they're on Mount Hermon. I don't know if they were specifically on Mount Hermon, but they came down, they cohabitated with women and they produced evil offspring through them. So even the book of Enoch refers to that. Okay. All right. Here's the third judgment. I think we've got a few minutes left. I'll just go ahead and finish the third uh, judgment. And we're reminded of judgment on the immorality of Sodom and Gomorrah. The judgment on the immorality of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, look at verse 7, Jude 7. He says, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they... Now, this is again referring back to these angels that sinned. Since they, in the same way as these, indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Okay, so it's talking about they, the, them in Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them. They, in the same way as these, talking about those evil angels, indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh. Notice the reference in 2 Peter uh, 2, verse 6. He says, And if he, God, condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly thereafter. So he describes God's judgment here on Sodom and Gomorrah. And also there was a couple of cities nearby, Adma and Zeboim, when God rained down fire and brimstone on these cities, and he did it because of their gross immorality and going after strange flesh. So again, strange flesh means going after flesh of a different nature. In other words, it was unnatural. It wasn't God's intention. 
In fact, in the story, we see the men of, of Sodom and Gomorrah wanting to have sexual relations with these visitors who were visiting Lot, and they were angels. So, so think about it. In, in, in the previous story I just talked about, the angels had sexual relations with humans. Here, we see humans trying to have sexual relations with angels. This is kind of an interesting uh, contrast there. And again, when he says, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality went after strange flesh, he's saying the people of Sodom and Gomorrah went after strange flesh through homosexuality. Just like the angels of verse 6 went after strange flesh in cohabitating with humans. So these Gentiles in Sodom and Gomorrah are apostates who were judged suddenly. Incidentally, sometimes you will hear those who believe in alternative sexual lifestyle, they'll try to... They'll say, oh, no, no, that's not correct. That's not why he, de he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And they'll, sh they'll show you Ezekiel chapter 16. So let me explain this. Look at Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50. This is, again, referring back to so Sodom. It says, behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease, but she did not help the poor and needy. See, they'll say, look at that. They, they didn't get, Sodom didn't get destroyed because of homosexuality. It got destroyed because they were selfish. All right, well, let's read on to the next verse. Thus, they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore, I removed them when I saw it. So again, in verse 50, these abominations, that's referring to the homosexuality. So Sodom and Gomorrah were not just destroyed because of homosexuality. They were destroyed because of their sin. That was one of the sins. They were also selfish. They were also prideful. So they got destroyed for all those sins. Now, let me just say here, because I don't want to be misunderstood. Look, God loves everybody. Amen. Loves everybody. Including those who are, in, who, are in, who are involved or inclined to alternative sexual lifestyles. God loves them. He doesn't approve of them having an alternative sexual lifestyle. But he loves them. He loves them so much he sent Yeshua to die for them. He wants them to realize that's not what God wants for them. That's not how he intended them to do it. He wants them to live a straight life. So we're not to go around. We don't hate homosexuals or lesbians. We don't hate people. God Loves them. We love them. He hates their sin. Just like he hates all sin. And he wants them to repent of that sin. Just like he wants everybody else to repent of their sins. So we're to show the love of the Lord to people involved in a homosexual lifestyle. People who are trying to figure out their sexual identity. We're to love these people. And we're trying to point them to Yeshua and point them to the truth. Okay, so... Jude shared those three examples of judgment from the past. Judgment of Jews wandering, who didn't enter into the promised land. These angels that, were, that, that sinned, the, the judgment of them, and, and the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, that's the Gentiles. Just like God judged these sinners in the past, he will judge these false teachers one day. That's the point he's trying to make here. The judgment might be sudden like he judged Sodom and Gomorrah. It might be a judgment over time during the natural course of events like the judgment of the unbelieving Israelites who came out of Egypt. Or it might be a judgment at the end of time like these angels are going to face. Nevertheless, God will judge these false teachers if they don't repent. Now, you might be wondering, why doesn't God just judge him right now? Why does he, when somebody's getting up in the pulpit and, and, and espousing this false doctrine, why doesn't he just shoot a lightning bolt down and strike them dead? The reason he doesn't do that is he, he's trying to give them a chance to repent. He's very patient. He's a merciful God. He doesn't desire anybody to perish. And so... 
He gives a warning in the word of God. We're, I'm giving a warning through this sermon that I'm preaching that false teachers and apostates need to repent. They need to stand by the truth of the word of God. That's our ultimate authority. So let's make sure that I hope everybody that's listening to me today or in the future uh, that we all have a personal saving relationship with Yeshua. We're trusting him alone as our savior. We're trusting him alone for forgiveness of our sin. That when he died 2,000 years ago, he was being punished for our sin. So we don't have to be punished for our sin. And let's share this truth with others. Even people who have lifestyles different than us or whoever we run into. And we're to stand up for the truth of the scriptures. And stand up against false teaching. So this is not, again, just pastors uh, or seminary professors and teachers. All of us need to stand up against false teaching. And let me say, irrespective of, of any sins that people have committed in the past, even if it was false teaching, God is willing to forgive them if they'll repent. Amen. All right, so let's close in prayer. So Lord... This is, I know it wasn't a politically correct sermon today, all right, but it's biblically correct. And, and Lord, it's just telling it like it is today. There's a lot, and sadly, more and more false teaching going on in our world, in, in congregations, in synagogues. Lord, I pray for people's eyes to be opened. I pray when there's false teaching that people will lovingly speak out against it. And that will stand for the truth of the word of God. And stand for the truth that there's only one way to heaven. It's only through Yeshua. Through being forgiven through Yeshua. And I pray for anyone who needs to accept Yeshua as their Messiah, Savior, and Lord. I pray they would just invite him into their heart right now. And trust him to forgive them of their sins and give them eternal life. I pray this in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Amen.